Back in Luke chapter number 18 and verse number 35, the Bible says, And it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside, Begging. Last Sunday morning, we talked about how that Jesus and his disciples have gotten close to Jericho. And as they get close to Jericho, there's a man by the name of Bartimaeus. We find out this man's name in Mark's account of this story. And Bartimaeus is sitting there. He's blind. He's begging, as was the custom of the day for a blind man who could not work and earn money for his family. And here he is begging, and he hears a multitude of people coming, and they pass by him, and as they pass by him, he asks what was going on. They tell him that Jesus is there. And so Jesus goes into Jericho, and when Jesus comes out, Bartimaeus is there, and this time he has a friend with him, as Matthew tells us about in his account of the story. And blind Bartimaeus and his friend cry out to Jesus. Jesus stops uh, after hearing their cries, and calls them over to him, heals them. These men begin to rejoice. The people there that once told him to be quiet and told his friend to be quiet now rejoice, and they follow Jesus. Now, I told you last Sunday morning that there was something that happened. There was a story that took place while Jesus was in Jericho, and we would cover that today. Jesus, the Bible tells us here in Luke chapter number 19 and verse number 1, he enters into Jericho now and passes through the city of Jericho. Someone, real quickly, by way of introduction, someone might say, well, wait a second, preacher, I'm confused. Why did Luke talk about the blind beggar and him being healed uh, before uh, telling us about Zacchaeus if the blind beggar wasn't healed until afterwards? Good question. Let me show you an example of this in the Bible where uh, things are written in a specific way. Turn all the way back to the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter number 1. Genesis chapter number 1 and verse number 26. Genesis chapter number 1 and in verse number 26. The Bible says here, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Here we have the account of the sixth day of creation. The first five days have already passed by. And verses 26 and 27 tell us about the sixth day. And what God created on the sixth day, of course, was man or Adam and Adam's wife. Eve, and the Bible gives us just a, a brief overview of this story. If we actually look to Genesis chapter number 2, and in verse number uh, 5, the Bible says, And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. Now wait a second. Back in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it said that God created Adam and Eve. Now here in Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 5, it says there wasn't a man to till the ground. Look at verse 6. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Here's the simple explanation for this. In chapter number 1, uh, God is giving us an overview of what happened on the six days of creation. And of course, remember, on the seventh day, God rested from all that he created. In Genesis chapter number 2, he now gives us specific details about the garden itself. He gives us specific details how Adam was formed or created and how Eve was formed later on in a, a verse number, verses 18 through 25. Now turning back to Luke chapter number 19 and our story this morning, as we said, Blind Bartimaeus was healed when Jesus came out, and as he and his disciples were departing from Jericho. But remember, that whole story started with Jesus and his disciples coming near to Jericho. That's where blind Bartimaeus hears about Jesus being in town, even though he doesn't get healed until later. And so what Luke is doing is he's giving us one story at a time. 
instead of starting blind Bartimaeus' story and then inserting this story that we're covering today and then going back to Bartimaeus', he just gives us Bartimaeus' account or Bartimaeus' story and now moves on and says, oh, by the way, there was something that happened in the city of Jericho. So look back to Luke chapter number 19, once again with me, if you would, in verse number 2. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich, and he sought to see Jesus who he was, and could not for the press, because he was of little or he was little of stature. Verse 4. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he, talking about Jesus, was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. For so much as he also is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. This morning I want us to look real briefly at this thought, the Savior and the sycamore. Here we have a very familiar story uh, in children's church or in the kids' Sunday school class. They uh, probably sing the song, Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. I know I sang that song when I was growing up. And I loved uh, singing that song with the kids when I would work in the junior church at, at our uh, home church. Uh, I, I loved singing that song. Well, here we have this story about Zacchaeus. And the song tells us some things about Zacchaeus, but I don't know if the, the story does, or the song does the story justice because there's so much more to this story than what the song simply covers. So that's what I want us to look at this morning is the, the, the Savior and the Sycamore. Now, real quickly. Uh, this story, Luke, in this story, Luke tells us some of the attributes of Zacchaeus. The first one he tells us about is in verse number two. It says, uh, "And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans." So the first thing we know about Zacchaeus was that he was the chief among the publicans. Now, uh, you may remember, as we have been studying the life of Christ, we've come across that term publican before. Remember, I told you it's not Republican, it's publican. There is a big difference, uh, depending on your political viewpoint. But uh, publicans, nonetheless, they were tax collectors. Remember Matthew, or Levi, as he's also called, before he fought, began following Jesus, was a publican. He was a tax collector. Zacchaeus, the Bible tells us, was the chief of the publicans, or the chief of the tax collectors. This means that he had uh, uh, the, the authority over all of the tax collectors in that region, uh, the region where Jericho was located. Now, this was important for a couple of reasons. If you look over here at the map, you'll see that uh, Jericho was right here. And you have the Jordan River that runs right here. Up here is the Sea of Galilee off the map, and here's the Dead Sea. So here's Jericho. During the time of Jesus, uh, you had the Jordan River that divided this area into two provinces, Judea, which is where Jerusalem was located, and Perea. So you have Judea and Perea, and Jericho was located right between the two, right along the Jordan River. Now, interestingly enough, in Perea, there was a special balm that was grown and made there. It was what was known as the balm of Gilead. And so the balm, a lot of times, would be brought to Jericho, and be traded there. Jericho was a, a, a wealth of, uh, of trading markets and, and places where people could sell things. And so because it was so important, because there was so much that was going through there as far as commerce, it was important that they had publicans. Or in the Romans' eyes, in the Roman government's eyes, it was important that they had tax collectors there to make sure that they collected on everything that was bought or sold much like in our day. Now, I think one of the things about this story that's unique and, and one of the aspects that we lose when we read this story is in the 21st century, you and I don't see the tax collector. If we see the tax collector, it's bad news, isn't it? If Mr. IRS has to come knock on our door, it's not good. 
the way that things work in the 21st century is we pay our taxes or our taxes are deducted uh, just automatically. When we pay for our groceries, it's there. When we get our check, it's already electronically taken out. Uh, all of these things are taken and done without us ever meeting a person face to face. So you and I don't put a face to the tax collector. We just know it as the IRS or the government. Back during the day of Jesus and during the time of the Roman government, they had tax collectors in every village or in every city. And Zacchaeus was one of these. People who lived in Jericho, they, they uh, identified him as the tax collector, as the guy who was collecting the money. And not only that, but as the chief of the tax collectors. In other words, if there were tax collectors that were sent out to these uh, areas around Jericho to collect taxes, they would bring the money, give it to him, and then he would be responsible for transmitting it or for sending it on to the Roman government. He had a lot of power. That's the first thing we're told about him. Back in verse number 2, it says that he was not only the chief among the publicans, but we're also told that he was rich. So monetarily, he was rich. He was wealthy. Now, we're told why he was wealthy in this story. In verse number 7, you remember here it says that when the people saw Jesus going to the house of Zacchaeus, that they said about Jesus that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. The people saw Jesus going into Zacchaeus' house, and they thought, wait a second, there's Jesus, this righteous prophet, this man who heals people and does all these good deeds, he is now going to the house of a sinner. Why did they think of him as a sinner? After all, I know that a lot of people have a bad viewpoint of the IRS, or they look, uh, especially back in the day of Jesus, they looked at publicans uh, with disdain because nobody really enjoys having to pay taxes. But why particularly did they look at this man and call him a sinner? Well, if you look down to verse number 8, his own words. Look at what Zacchaeus said to Jesus when Jesus was in his house. Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and this is the part that's the key, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation. There's no if about it, Zacchaeus. He did do that. I restore him fourfold. So, the reason they referred to him as a sinner was because he would falsely accuse people. He would say, this person hasn't paid their taxes. Of course, remember, he's the one keeping the record. He's the one receiving the money. And he would falsely accuse people so that they had to pay more or they had to pay twice. And then he would take that extra tax money and keep it for himself. This is why they looked at him as a sinner. He was a cheater. He was a deceiver. At the same time, this is how he became monetarily rich. The third thing that we're told about him is in verse number 3. It says, And he sought to see Jesus who he was and could not for the press because he was little of stature. You've heard that old phrase, two out of three ain't bad. Well, in his case, he was rich and he had a, a job of authority and power, but the downfall was he was a short man. He was little of stature. Now someone says, well, preacher, uh, you know, that's not such a bad thing. I agree, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. But in our day and age, even in the 21st century, we do look at people and we, a lot of times, look at them based off their physical appearance, their height, their weight, and so on and so forth, and we make judgments. A lot of these are false judgments. Here was a man who was of uh, little stature, but as we're going to see here in just a minute, he was of great faith or of big faith. So these are the attributes that we're told about Zacchaeus. Now, real quickly, we are told that he comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior. So let's, let's look at the attributes of his salvation. First off, we are told that he sought Jesus in verse 3, and he sought to see Jesus who he was. Here's Zacchaeus. Let's be reminded who he was. Because once again, and I'm not... I'm not condemning the children's song. The children's song is great. But in this children's song, it talks about him being a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Now think about this for a second. This is a man of power, authority, riches, or wealth. Okay, he's despised maybe by the people of his community. But he has a lot of what people in the 21st century want. Fame and money. And yet he wants to see this Jesus. 
He's heard that Jesus is in town, a Jewish carpenter, a Jewish rabbi or teacher, and he wants to see Jesus. So the Bible says that he sought to see Jesus. He couldn't see Jesus. He was too short. And so what does he do? In verse number 4 it says, And he ran before and climbed up into sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. He desired to see Jesus, and he sought out Jesus to the point that he would climb up in a tree. Now, I'm 36, but I can't think of the last time I climbed up into a tree. We were watching, our family and I, we were watching uh, Little House on the Prairie, one of the old episodes of Little House on the Prairie, a couple, I think it was a week or so ago. And uh, the father, uh, Mr. Ingalls, he, he's all happy because he's just paid off their house and he, he, he uh, fulfilled all his obligations in town. And so they're having a picnic and all of a sudden the kite that he's flying gets stuck in the tree. And so he says, it's okay, I'll get it. And he climbs up into the tree, and as he's climbing up into the tree, he falls out of the tree and messes up his arm. That's the reason why I don't climb up into trees anymore. I'm not as limber as I used to be. I'm, I'm pretty sure most of us are the same way. We don't want to fall out of the tree. Here's a guy, I don't know how old he was, the Bible doesn't tell us, but he was a chief uh, in his area. He was, a, he was a very prominent and powerful. So he probably was middle-aged, and yet he didn't allow the heights to uh, bother him or affect him. He wanted to see Jesus. And so he climbed up into that tree. The second thing that we see as an attribute of his salvation, he obeyed Jesus. Look at verse number 5. It says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Jesus says to him, Hey, Zacchaeus, come down here. And isn't it interesting that Jesus knew his name? Isn't it interesting that here's Zacchaeus up in the tree just trying to get a glimpse of Jesus, and all of a sudden, Jesus looks straight at him and says, Hey, Zacchaeus, get down here, because I'm going to your house. And Zacchaeus heard that. And what did he do? He had a choice. He was at a crossroads. Do I get down, or do I stay in the tree? Uh, once again, this is a humbling thing. I guarantee you, everybody turns to look up. And how would you feel if you were Zacchaeus, the wee little man, with all the power, with all this money, and here you are up in a tree just trying to catch a glimpse of this Jewish rabbi or Jewish teacher, and everybody looks up at him. He has a choice. Can he try to hide? You ever done that before where you were playing hide-and-seek or maybe when your parents were trying to look for you and you just thought, if I'm really still, no one will see me, even though you stuck out like a sore thumb. Probably every one of us has done that. He could have just tried to stay real quiet and to see if anybody really noticed him or to hope that Jesus would keep going by, or he could get down and admit, hey, I was up in the tree because I was looking for this Jesus. And he did it, the Bible says in verse number 6, and he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. He obeyed the Lord. He came down, the third attribute of his salvation. He received Jesus. It's now, of course, it doesn't say that he received him into his heart. But he received Jesus physically. He said, Lord, come to my house. And he was joyful about it. Nonetheless, we see through all of these actions, his faith. Remember what James said in James chapter number 2 about faith, that your faith is known by your works. Works do not save a person, but your works show your faith. And so we see through his actions that he had faith. He got saved. Now with all that said, here's this man who turns to Christ. And Jesus is coming to his house. I want us to, to look at three real quick things that I think can apply to us this morning. First off, we see that Zacchaeus, after he got saved, or after all this occurred, spent time with Jesus. In verse number 5, what, is it, what did Jesus say? Jesus said at the end there, For today I must abide at thy house. Abide. Jesus told us that we should abide in him. That means that we need to fellowship with Him. We need to spend time with Him. In this uh, verse, Jesus said, I must abide at thy house. I need to come to your place of residence. In verse number 7, once again, those that were watching said that Jesus was going to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Uh, after he uh, had sought out Jesus and he had uh, obeyed Jesus and received Jesus, he gets down from the tree and joyfully says, Please come to my house. And he takes Jesus into his house, and he spends time with Jesus. Each and every day, I need to make sure that I spend time with Jesus. It doesn't matter how profitable I am. It doesn't matter 
how well my week has gone. It doesn't matter uh, what my position is at the workplace. I should never get too big for Jesus. I should never get to the point where I think I don't need to spend time with Him. Every day of my life, I need to spend time with the Lord. As a result, because he spent time with Jesus, we are then told that Zacchaeus was changed by Jesus. Look at here in verse number 8. Now he's already been changed spiritually. He's put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He's a saved man. But look at verse number 8. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have given anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. What prompted this? Jesus didn't ask him any question, did he? Jesus didn't say, Zacchaeus, I know you're a sinner, and I know that by false accusation you're taking from people, and Zacchaeus, I know you're a wicked, wicked man. He didn't say anything. He went to his house. Zacchaeus spent time with him. Zacchaeus was convicted. By the way, when you spend time with God, you will be convicted because each of us still falls short of the glory of God. We still are imperfect. And as a result, he confessed that he had done some things wrong. At the same time, you notice here how he says, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. He didn't say, I will give them to the poor. He says, I give to the poor. Uh, he goes on to say, And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Up to this point, he hadn't done that before he met Jesus. He hadn't given half of his goods to the poor. He hadn't restored uh, fourfold to those that he had taken from. But he says it with the present tense. He doesn't say, I did it. And he doesn't say, I'm going to do it. He says, I am doing it. Remember, he's the chief of the publicans, right? Which means that the tax collectors answer to him. Which means Jesus came into his house. He spent time with Jesus. He was convicted. And he changed. He said, you know what? I may be saved now, I may know Christ personally now, but I, there's some things in my life that have to be changed. And he called these, I believe, of course this is just my, my belief, I believe he called the publicans, the tax collectors that served under him and said, listen guys, I want you to take this money up and give it to the poor. And I want you to take this and go down this list and give this to these people that I've cheated. Because he used the present tense. Either way, he was a changed man. Last thing we see, as a result of spending time with Jesus, he was changed. And as a result of being changed, Zacchaeus was used by Jesus. Look at verse number 9. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. You notice how it doesn't say, This day is salvation come to this man, but to this house. Because Zacchaeus spent time with Jesus, he was changed by Jesus. Because he allowed Jesus to change him, to mold him and make him into what God wanted him to be, he was used by Jesus to reach his family. Remember the last time that someone was in Jericho? That's recorded. It's in Joshua. We just read it if you uh, are following the Old Testament Bible reading schedule. Joshua chapter number 2, Rahab the harlot lived in the city of Jericho. A harlot, just like a tax collector, someone that people look down upon, but she had faith in God. And she was told by the two spies that came into Jericho, if you leave this scarlet thread tied, from your, uh, tied at your window there, when we come into the land and we invade Jericho, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and save you and anyone in your house. As a result, she was saved, but not just her. Her family was saved as well because they were in the house with her. When we, allow, when we spend time with Jesus and we allow him to change us, we are used by him to reach our family, to reach our friends to reach the people we care about. And that's what happened with Zacchaeus. Let's pray. Father, thank you for all that you've done.